morning's reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise, and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <coughs> Well, we are uh, in the third series on uh, overflow, which is just, uh, we're trying to show, we're trying to talk about in scripture is that we believe the best, the best expression of your faith, and whatever ever circumstance it is, is when it's coming from a place where you're naturally overflowing with the gospel. And we're trying to pick apart what that looks like and sounds like and feels like and so a little pictures for you today again trying to trying to talk what is it what is it today we're talking about uh, expressions of joy there's different expressions of joy that we see in media a lot or just in around like there's the famous one when your team wins the big game the famous gatorade bath um i don't know it's joyful for the coaches players putting on the coach or what but there's joy there around surrounding something uh at a wedding when you finally pronounce a husband and wife married that first kiss um is always an exciting moment uh, another expression of joy that um, I'll only leave a picture up for a second because it's too short. But if we ever want to be in a get the warm fuzzies, just watch one of those reunions where a soldier who's been away for a while is reunited with their family. How does that not cause you to tear jerk too much? But what makes all those so great is that they're real. Uh, it's, the, it's the real emotion when the couple gets to kiss for the first time, or the team has finally won uh, that game, or the family the family is finally reunited, right? We can relate to all of those things because we know what those things feel like on some small scale to be away from someone and be united to finally get something you've been working for, or, or we know someone who's been married to, and they finally get married to the love of their life. We, we can relate to that. But again, what I think what makes them all so great is that they're authentic. And why it's so important we're talking about this is that uh, we believe, particular Christians believe, that joy is something that's only found when, when you know Christ. That joy is something deeper than being happy. And why it's so important we look at this is because we believe one of the effects of sin is that we've been robbed of that joy. The joy we saw in all those places, uh, the joy we have of being united from God has been ripped from us because of sin. And the gospel, the message of Christ, has come to do something about that. So we would experience that authentic kind of joy when it comes to knowing our place in this universe. That's what we're going to look at today through the eyes of this story. Now, a lot of times, just so you know, if you haven't read Acts, um, some people call it the Acts of the Apostles, but we really, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit uh, working around amongst his people. And a lot of times, when we read this story in particular, if you haven't, you've just read it now, but a lot of times in churches, they want you to read the story and think of what it would be like for you to be Philip. And I want you to not do that. Uh, today, we're, we're the Ethiopian eunuch today. So we're reading it from his perspective. Got it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for how great you are. We pray for We thank you for all the kids that are here. Whatever age they're at, Lord, we pray through the teachers, through the parents, Lord, that you would saturate their hearts with the gospel. Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, you would do the same thing 
this morning. May we die to ourselves because of your word and become more alive to you. Awaken our hearts. We ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, again, trying to explain overflow, I remember, uh, uh, if you know, you've been around too many church people, uh, when you're not around church people and you say something very churchy, and they look at you like, what did you just speak? Uh, I remember once I was talking to someone uh, in my uh, family, and I was like, oh, I think someone, sometimes people can over-spiritualize stuff, and sometimes people can under-spiritualize stuff. And I remember he looked at me very confused, as I, and he was like, I don't even understand that concept. What are you, what are you talking about right now? And so, just to give a couple of illustrations in case you find yourself in that same uh, place of like, what does overflow really mean? Um, so I'm going to give just one little quick analogy for you. We'll do more next week too. But what it is, it's uh, thinking about Christmas trees. You know when you go to the store and you get the Christmas tree before you decorate it? It's kind of sad. It's all wrapped up and dead. And then, a few days later, once you decorate it, it's this big, beautiful thing. Same thing, we're kind of talking about your heart. And we're talking about overflowing is that what your heart was like before... You interacted with God, and what it's kind of is like after. And I, I was going to put a picture of a sad puppy, but you guys can't handle that. So, uh, uh, but the reason I'm going to do that because what the gospel, is, what the overflowing is not, and I want you to understand this: it's not a feeling. It's important to understand this isn't a feeling; it's not an emotion. Uh, what we've been trying to show that this overflowing is a response to you coming into contact and being filled by God. And so what we're looking at here, <coughs> where we're starting off, is that the book of Acts is really, God is expanding his kingdom. And what's really important to see is that he's making sure to understand that the people and the places and the way it's being expanded, this particular passage shows it better than others, is that it's going, it's no longer uh, geographically centered. Uh, it's no longer ethnically centered. It's no longer... Um, language centered it's no longer even religion centered it's going to all peoples and places no matter where they're from what their background is the gospel the message is going out to all of them and this is really important for us i want to say important because of what happened to the eunuch here and why this is so important is that what every culture has in common what all of us have in common with each other is that we have idols. We have people or things or places. Your geography can become an idol. Your language, your culture, your ethnicity, all those things can become an idol where you drive, derive your, your identity from those things. And we call those idols is because those are never, ever designed to fulfill you and make you whole. This is marriage class 101. When I do marriage counseling with couples, one of the first things I tell them is that if you're expecting to have your deepest longings met by the sinful person sitting next to you, you're in a world of hurt. They are going, only going to let you down. If your deepest longings are met by Jesus Christ, then you don't have to worry about that person sitting across from you trying to do any of that. Right? It's marriage counseling 101. But it's life one, right? For those of you not getting married, it would be how many likes does it take to finally make you feel significant in this world? How many followers would it take? What we're trying to communicate is that the gospel is saying none of that stuff will ever give you any satisfaction. And this is where we find ourselves in the story today. Philip was one of those who's being sent, and it's in the middle of the story doing some pretty fantastic things. And we start off at verse 26, right? 26 to 32, and it starts off um, like this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went there, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he came to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning seated in his chariot. And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit of the Lord said to Philip, Go over and join the chariot. So Philip ran to him, and he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now what is this, again, what is this passage talking about? What do we want to see here? Well, first, again, we want to focus on the Ethiopian, not Philip. Um, you guys are not the hero. But uh, I want to focus on Philip for a second, is that uh, Philip was going around, and, and uh, uh, as uh, Paul and I were talking about this passage, Paul's preaching the same uh, passage tonight in the evening, so we're talking about how 
Um, uh, Jerusalem's kind of where you wanted to be. That was like saying I was going to be in New York, and then God was asking you to go to the middle of a field in Ohio. You're like, huh? Not, not in Ohio. I'm not going to just the middle of nowhere. Sorry. Sorry for Ohio people. I wasn't trying to knock you. Uh, middle of nowhere in Virginia, okay? But, because um, it says, go, I want you to go, go to this desert place. And Philip just goes. And that's important to know because Philip had the best thing with him when he went. The best thing wasn't in Jerusalem. The best thing was his faith, and that's what he brought with him. But he was told to go to a nowhere place, right? To a nowhere, just go. And so he went. And thankfully he listened because of what happened off everything after that. And we meet the eunuch now. The eunuch, um, again, by a status, the word Candace there, you can read about that. was just a, uh, another title for, for queen. But he had an important role with Ethiopia. And again, it's not Ethiopia we think of now. It's a bigger, think of Nubian Empire. It's the, this is not the same geopolitical lines we have today. But it was that part of Africa. And he'd been sent, and it says he would come to Jerusalem to worship. Um, and so what we know about him then is that he was a eunuch, um, was from Africa. So most likely he didn't look like the people of Jerusalem, he was probably black, from a different culture, a different place, different tribe, different tongue, everything was different about him, and he was there. So he probably stood out for a lot of reasons. But what he says he was doing there, what we learn about him, is that he'd come to worship. Now, the, the way it worked was to, to be, um, again, to know how, how insider you were, how real Jewish you were, the Jerusalem temple let you know. How close you could get to the temple, the center of the temple, let you know how much Jew you were. And so he, being a eunuch, couldn't have come more than a certain distance. He was on the outside. He couldn't come in because he was considered unclean. And again, if you were, again, there was courts of Gentiles, there were courts of women, there were the courts of men, there were all these things, limitations to get you to inside there. And so he would have gone there to worship knowing that he was not allowed to get in. There was a, a bubble, a force field that spiritually he wasn't allowed to approach because physically he was different and ethnically he was different and all these other things, religious too. But it says he was coming to worship. And, and in that time, there were three categories of people. If you weren't born Jewish, there were three categories that you could have fallen in. A benefactor was someone like today. They just they were they were supportive of you. They were supportive of the Jewish cause. Um, the next was something the scripture calls as a God fear. Um, that's someone who was more than just supportive, but they were very interested. They they went to learn. They wanted to know a little more. And the final one was a proselyte. Some proselyte was someone who actually converted to Judaism. I'm trying to think of the difference between the God fear and the proselyte. What the difference would be like if you imagine in college you take some courses for credit. Or some courses you can audit. There's between auditing and taking for credits. He wanted to be there. And it says he was worshiping, which probably means um, he was definitely not a benefactor. Probably not a God fearer, but probably someone who was had somehow level converted. But even in that he converted, he could still only get so close. And he came to worship. But again, what's impressive about these two men is that when Philip said was told to go talk to him. He, he ran to go speak to him. He went to go speak to him. <coughs> it was very common at that time he to read out loud. And so the eunuch was sitting there reading out loud from the prophet Isaiah. And we'll talk about this <coughs> important, but there's a passage just a few chapters before this passage in Isaiah where specifically there's a, a mention of those who are eunuchs. Well, there's something God will do and allow them to draw in all the way to worship. And so you can imagine being, he knew about that especially because that was him. And so he's reading this passage in Isaiah. And Philip's told to go talk to him. Philip goes to talk to him. And the image is not... Uh, so this important person was sitting on his chariot reading it aloud. And the idea is more probably something like uh, Philip ran and kind of got close. Didn't like jump on top of the chariot. But kind of yelled across, how's it going? And the Ethiopian yelled back, I guess I'm doing fine. What are you reading? I don't know. What a great response. I don't really know what I'm reading. Unless someone were to come tell me. You can imagine the reason why the author wanted to put in here that uh, Philip had been told to go to a desert place is because Philip didn't know why he was told to go there. He just went. And you can see at that moment, probably why he was so excited and ran is that he realized, this is why I was told to come here. 
probably many of us have experiences where something happened or we did something and it wasn't great, but over time we see how God blessed it. Philip was told to get away from the action and go to this nowhere desert place. And now this Ethiopian literally says, if only someone would come tell me what I'm reading. <laughs> right? Philip's like, ah, this all makes sense. John Calvin, the theologian from about 500 years ago, when talking about this passage, said, uh, what's common to man is that we have an, I use the word, something like a, 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 an inflated head. <laughs> In Calvin's word, he said that our inflated heads usually mean that none of us on a good day, he said one in a hundred people, if you had a hundred people, maybe one of them might admit they don't understand what they're reading when it comes to the Bible. He said, but the truth is, most of our inflated heads, we, all of us, 99 of us would say, no, I know exactly what I'm reading and have no clue. And he said, how much more then would you even be willing to let someone else even teach you, right? That's, that's how prideful as humans we can be. So Calvin was, Calvin was astounded by this passage, not that God was maneuvering. He was astounded that the Ethiopian was willing to admit he didn't know what he was reading. And so he comes to talk about this. He invites him up into the chariot to come and talk. And it's this humility of the eunuch, that's the Spirit of God was already encouraging him, the humility of Philip. There's something great is going to happen here. But I want to see that uh, the eunuch was being led by something. His, his pride wasn't on the line. There was something great. He was willing to admit, I don't know this, and I, I, it's more important for me to acknowledge I don't know this than it is to pretend like I do. And the same thing with Philip. It was more important for him to listen and follow than it was to just be in Jerusalem. So my first question for us, I'm reading 26 through 32, when I ask you is, what is guiding your faith? Who is guiding your faith? Are you able to admit you don't know what you're doing? It's not once you become a Christian, you got it all figured out. It's just once you become a Christian, you know who Jesus is. But many of us can't admit that at all. And we're going to see the importance of being able to Understand who's guiding you in the very next passage. So we're going to go to verse 32 to 35. So this is what he was reading. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading, I said was from Isaiah. It was from Isaiah uh, 53, and it says this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear it was silent. So he opened not his mouth, in his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Now that might sound a little confusing, right? But we know again... From what Isaiah says that, we can see why, again, the, the eunuch is probably convert. And we also can see, and so by that, he knows that because of who he is, he's still not allowed to go all the way to the temple, all the way to God. And there's a promise in Isaiah that somehow that's going to happen. So you can see what he's, he's kind of thinking, why he would be reading this, what he's, what he's going through. But let me go on. It says, uh, going through 35 here, it says this. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask, does this prophecy say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth and began with the scripture. Began with this scripture. He told them the good news about Jesus. Now, again, why is this so important? Uh, another common uh, theologian, a guy named John Stott, said that at the time when this was written, there was no... Like, for us to say Jesus suffered makes sense, right? Because we know Jesus suffered. At the time when this happened, <coughs> aside from people who knew Jesus... 99.999% of the people did not associate the, the Messiah with suffering. The Messiah was a hero coming to conquer. There's no suffering combined with that. And so that the fact that the eunuch would even ask the question, is this talking about the prophet or someone else, showed that the Spirit of God was turning inside the eunuch. That he could read a passage and immediately discern what theologians and rabbis and priests would have read a hundred times and not have noticed. That he was, again, the Spirit had awoken his heart enough that he read this and said, this sounds like there's something else going on here. Am I wrong? Am I right or am I wrong? And that's, again, where we find this amazing response that says, Philip said, let's just <laughs> we'll start right here. <laughs> he starts right here and explains to him Christ goes through the Old Testament, we'll start with this passage, we'll start with this supper, we're going to start with what we need to what needs to happen, and he, he brings them to the throne of Christ. 
And now this is so important. Again, we talked about what is guiding your faith. We need to know that scripture, everything in Scripture is pointing to Christ. And we need to see that when we look at Scripture, that it's all pointing to Christ. So the eunuch was being led by his desire to know the truth of this. He was willing to put down pride and humility and say, I, I want to know what this is about. His heart was ready and ripe. The Spirit had prepared him to see this for this moment. Just like Philip had been brought in, the Ethiopian eunuch had been brought in. It was all ready and ripe. This reminds me of any of you who have smartphones. Um, uh, uh, smartphones are interesting things. I, uh, we had to, uh, one of our sons, we, we had to get him a smart device um, uh, for, for school, and uh, he's, he's nine, and we gave it to him, and a couple weeks later, he was doing something on it, and, uh, and I said, what are you doing? And my other son was like, oh, he figured out how to do whatever. And I was like, how on earth? When was there even time for you to know secret codes on this iPad? What is going on here? And uh, I remember that, and I was like, what else do I don't know? And I went to a website and said, things you should know about your smartphone that you don't know. And there was a particular mechanism, you know, I'm trying to sell I, I, with smart devices, but there was something on my phone that I didn't know existed that makes life a lot easier. And apparently it's been there the entire time. And I called a friend up to tell him, did you know my phone could do this? And he goes, I just figured out the same thing. Well, it's all there, just needed to learn. Scripture is there. We just need to learn. And the Ethiopian was saying, I'm ready to learn. And Philip knew Scripture enough. So when the time came, he could guide the eunuch straight to Christ. There was no meandering. There was no getting lost. He didn't have to say, wait, I need to go YouTube it. He was able to walk him to Christ. So what is guiding your faith is so important because we see Philip, what's guiding his faith is the word of God. And so when the eunuch was ready and needed to know, Philip was able to take him right there. All scripture points to Christ. So if the first question was, what is guiding your faith? My second question for all of us is this, do you know the gospel? Mm -hmm. Could you go anywhere in scripture? Could someone come to you anywhere in scripture and say, show me Jesus? The applicable part is this. Let's not worry about the Bible for a second. Someone should be able to come to you with anything in their life. And whatever they're going through, difficult marriage, we just had people going through a shutdown, personal sins, struggles, we should be able to walk them to Christ wherever they're at. However broken and shameful they feel, no matter what circumstances we find them, we should be able to walk them to Christ. And now we see the response. Verse 36 to 39 says this. And as he was going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And they had come up out of the water. The Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. <coughs> There's this one overflow that happens here, but we're seeing two responses of this overflow. See, the eunuch was saying, I know there's something I'm missing, and Philip's like, it's Christ. And when it happens, again, the, the way it's talking about there's a little time that happened there. They must have explained to him, Philip must have explained what it means to be a part of the body of Christ, that the eunuch was like, I think it's, I, I, why shouldn't I be baptized? Again, remember, everything about him, his ethnicity, his language, but originally it was, everything was about him was telling you're not one of us, and now that he understands what Christ has done, he's not saying, why shouldn't I be saying, why shouldn't I be baptized? What he's saying is, I am a family member with God. I am covenantally one of his. I am one of his chosen. Why shouldn't I do what the church says they get to do, what the body of God says to do, which is to be baptized. That's your entrance. Again, baptism symbolizes that you're a part of God's family. It points to God. It points that God has claimed you as his own. It doesn't point to yourself, it points to him. And the eunuch is saying, why shouldn't I be baptized? And Philip's pretty much saying, why shouldn't you be baptized? You're one of us. And they go to be baptized. <clears throat> it used to be when I was a little bit, uh, when I was uh, like in high school, the expression used to be, you know, I'm so, I'm so involved, I bought the t-shirt. 
But now it is, you know, it's got to be, do you have the act? So he was still in, he got the act. Like, he's all in. He went and got himself baptized right there. Because it represents that he's now part of God's family. And the second thing, I just want to point out the end is we're focusing on the eunuch here. It does say Philip was spirited away. We don't really know what that, that means. It's an interesting phrase of how he just kind of went off. But the eunuch here, at the end, it says he went on his way rejoicing. This is what I want to end with. We're talking about these authentic, amazing expressions of joy. Right? His response, his overflowing was to go and go, remember, before this moment, the only joy he could hope to find was to travel all the way to Jerusalem. But what he's rejoicing about now is that he no longer needs to ever come back. Jerusalem doesn't matter anymore. Because God is with him wherever he goes. He is joyfully going back. He's one of the first intercontinental missionaries in the Bible. He is joyfully headed back to Africa, where he might be the only Christian he knows, but he's joyfully headed that way. Just like Philip willingly went to this desert place, the Ethiopian is now joyfully headed on his way. Philip isn't even with them. The eunuch is all by himself. But he's going with God. He has met Jesus Christ on this journey. And that is all he needs for the rest of his life. No matter what comes. That too is what overflow looks like. Remember, when reading these stories, your job isn't to mimic this purpose, these, these people. What the eunuch did was between him and his Savior. What David did when he danced was between him and his Savior. What, Zachar, what Zacchaeus did was between him and his Savior. So how are you going to respond that the gospel has come to you, that God has claimed you as a part of his family? His location, his status, could never have satisfied him. But now coming in contact with the risen Savior, he's completely satisfied. His joy is in him. We aren't meant to emulate him. We are meant to to follow him in his authentic expression of being overflowed with joy. So, end today with this. What would an overflow of the gospel look like in your life? Just pray with me. Lord Jesus, we know. We know because it told us he walked, you, he walked the eunuch through. That the eunuch was responding to the fact that his sins are real, but have been paid for. That he has been freed from death and that he is being clung to by you and you alone. Because of that, he can look at the rest of his life and know no matter what happens, he will have joy. Not an emotion, but a certainty of his eternity. Lord, help us to have that kind of overflowing faith. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.